Good morning, church. You might be thinking, it's a little quieter in here. It looks a little bit different. You're right. It's a little quieter and it looks a little bit different in here. Over the weekend, our sound system died. So the soundboard that is in the back today isn't what is being used. We've got our sound over here, and it's coming through these small speakers over on my side. Uh, last week, I mentioned to you that I have been praying that God move in this church, that God do something in this church. And I don't know what, and it's not my job to know what, but it's my job to be faithful and to pray for our church. Well, apparently Satan doesn't like it. And he's trying to stop whatever it is that God is doing in our church. God is not deterred by a sound system not working. Amen. Amen. So this morning we are going to praise, we are going to worship, we are going to sing as loud as we can to our God who is our Savior. And it doesn't matter if our sound system is not working. You stand and you sing because you are
morning, church. It's good to be with you all on this uh, beautiful morning. Uh, I don't know if you've been enjoying the weather, uh, but I hope you have. And so, is my, if you don't know me, my name is Stephen Grayson. I'm a minister of students here, and it's my honor to welcome you all uh, here on this, on this morning to join in worship, use your voices to praise and sing how great our God is. Uh, and how great he is, one who had, did not abandon us, or one who never uh, is never far away, um, can always feel the spirit. And how appropriate that is uh, today, I think it Sunday. Before we continue to uh, pray, if you are new, we'd love to get to know you, brother in person, or uh, through the welcome on the back of your program guide, we'd love to get to know you and uh, just chat. Uh, all right, let's uh, continue with prayer. Let's continue with prayer and then worship. We can. God, thank you for the space where we can just feel the freedom to worship you. To just be ourselves, to come to you completely uh, as we are. No expectations. Thank you, God, for this space, and this presence, this community that we can all come together and to praise your name. Thank you for Joel and the worship team as they lead us in song, and for Joey as he dives into the word and brings the word to us. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit, that it rests within us, that we can know that you are always there, no matter what we are going through, no matter where we are. Help us to honor you, Lord, today. Thank you. Amen. We're going to continue singing together, celebrating that we have a living God. Would you sing as we uh, as we declare that God is alive and forever.
Heavenly Father, we come before you grateful for the ability to praise you and the movement that we do on the Holy Spirit. When we are faithfully serving you, Lord, and we are praising you and lifting your name up. Give us the strength to go about our day, remind us of the purpose that you give us, Lord. Let this church be one of, of faithfulness and Grace to each other and um, ultimately fulfilling what you want us to be filled. Be with Joey as a good sermon and be with us as we go through our days. Amen.
enough today, Mike. Whenever uh, I forget to turn my microphone back on, that just complicates everything. You know, I wasn't concerned um, hearing that uh, we had no sound system in terms of our musicians, because I knew that Joel could probably handle whatever we threw at him, and the rest of our musicians could uh, probably handle that as well. Um, I was a bit concerned, though, about how we were going to have any sound at all. Um, but then I remember we had Mark Martin on our team. And our Swiss Army knife uh, got to work and uh, patched this together yesterday. So I, I do want to say a particular thank you, <coughs> excuse me, to Mark uh, for making that happen. I uh, probably might show up and have a parking lot church sort of thing like we did a few years ago. Um, but I was pleasantly surprised uh, to be able to, uh, to hear uh, this morning during first service and again uh, now during second service. So thank you, uh, Mark, and uh, everybody else for just kind of going with uh, whatever uh, gets thrown our way. Our scripture reading this morning is going to be in Acts chapter 2. It is uh, Pentecost, uh, that church holiday where we celebrate the arrival of the Spirit. But um, I want to give you a little preface here of kind of what I would like to do this morning. I'm going to actually take us to three different texts in, well, more than that, but mostly three different texts. Uh, we are going to anchor today's sermon in Numbers 11, Joel chapter 2, and then Acts chapter 2. So uh, I'm going to all three of those places, just a little heads up, as uh, prepare for that, um, but our scripture reading itself will uh, pick up in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken at the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's pray that one more time. Happy you are grateful for the gift of gathering and as your people and the gift of worship. To be able to participate in worship and to be able uh, to offer ourselves and uh, all of the various parts of our lives, God, uh, back to you, it is a gift. We pray, God, that the words that we speak and the songs that we sing, the prayers that we pray and everything else in between, God, would be received as a gift. Uh, for certainly, you are worthy of all of it. Lord, we ask that as we turn our attention now uh, to your word, uh, that the meditations of all of our parts here together, God, uh, words that I might speak um, would be found acceptable and pleasing in your sight. For you, O oh God, are our rock and our good. Amen. Not only do I want to talk about the Spirit this morning, but I, I kind of want to use today as a jumping off point into the next sermon series that we will begin next week. And we are beginning a uh, trip through uh, what we often refer to as the Minor Prophets, um, but we will refer to repeatedly as the Book of the Twelve. And that may be a term you're familiar with, and it may not be a term you're familiar with, but um, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, what is a prophet, and um, also within the, the broader discussion of what is a prophet, kind of the, the more narrow discussion of what are the prophetic books and, and how do these all work together. So the first thing that I would ask, and I'm going to need your help on this one, is uh, what is a prophet? How would you define a prophet? Speaks for God. Okay, great. Sarah kind of nailed the definition, so we end the discussion at that point. Um, but I think one of the things I want us to think through a little bit is if you weren't in church and you just heard the term prophet in terms of the way that we use it in English, um, how do we often use that language or that word? Kind of something about predictive or you know future telling or even you know, fortune telling, that sort of thing, right? I mean that's you know baked into the English definition of, of that word or the way that we use it, at least in common English, we assume that uh, to be a prophet means to tell something about the future, about what is coming. 
Now, that is problematic because that is not the biblical definition of a prophet. And, and what Sarah just hit on is it's much closer to the biblical definition of a prophet. It, it's someone who speaks for God. And, and sometimes those messages from God do have a future oriented component to them, certainly, but not all the time. And it certainly is not a requirement of a prophetic word or someone who is a prophet. Are you following me so far? So sometimes future, not always. Got it? And I just kind of want to break that from our, our, you know, I don't know, just the front of our minds at least, um, so that we think of a, a prophet as even maybe a little bit more broadly defined. A, a prophet throughout the biblical literature is someone who has, um, you know, a, a personalized encounter with God that then leads them uh, to speak a word or to do an action on behalf of God. Does that make sense? They encounter God, and then they are sent out with a task or a, a message on behalf of God uh, to perform. And, and so we'll talk more about that. But, you know, whenever I say, you know, the prophets in the Bible, like, who, who do you think of? Nobody. Oh, okay, we're going to go back to, like, elementary Bible school here, all right? Most of you are thinking, like, Isaiah and Malachi, right? Mark, if you would grow up with a graphic, of course, maybe a little hard to read font-wise, but... Um, if you look at this right-hand column, we have the prophets in the Protestant Old Testament, okay? And so, you, if you memorize the books of the Bible, you, you know, you go from Isaiah to Malachi, and that's the end of the Old Testament. They are part of those 39 books that we consider to be the Old Testament. Are, are you with me? We see a little division there between Daniel and Hosea, and, and those of you who know more about the categories that we have to put them into, those first five books in the Protestant Old Testament we refer to as what? The major prophets. All right, somebody's on All right. The last 12 we refer to as what? Minor. Minor. I'm going to try to minimize the amount of times I say minor prophets over the next few months, okay? And, and again, the reason, but it's not a terrible term. I mean, what we mean by major is uh, they're long. The longer prophets and the shorter prophets is what we're talking about here. Does that make sense? But, I mean, a book like Isaiah, you know, pretty long book, right? And... If you think about the way that that book would have been written on a scroll in the ancient world, it probably kind of maxed out the length that a scroll would contain. Are you with me? Same with the prophet Jeremiah. But the reason that we call it the book of the twelve is because these twelve that we often call minor prophets or shorter prophets were all contained within the same work. Do you understand? So there was a scroll of the twelve, or a book of the twelve, as it was often. Uh, talk about. And so, whenever we talk about the book of the twelve, this is what we're talking about. Hosea and Malachi. Okay? Alright, now, you also see that we have on the left hand column a, a different list. And, and these are the prophets in the Hebrew Bible. Okay? Um, you'll notice that this looks a little different than the other list, doesn't it? Now, they also divide them into two categories. And those top four, they consider to be the former prophets. And, and then the, the rest of the list, they consider to be the latter prophets. But they have books like Joshua and Judges. Samuel and Kings. By the way, first and second Samuel are, are one scroll in the Hebrew Bible, so it's just Samuel. First and second Kings, Samuel, okay? Now, we have the same books in the Hebrew Bible as in the Protestant Old Testament, but the way that they are arranged and the ways that they are considered or categorized are different. So you'll, you'll see a few other differences here. One, the Book of Lamentations, which is attached to Jeremiah in our Old Testament, is not found in the prophets in the Hebrew Bible. That is included in the writings. There are three categories in the Hebrew Bible. Books of the Law, or we call them the Torah or the Pentateuch, okay, the first five books, Genesis to Deuteronomy. Then we have the writings, and then we have the prophets, okay? Are you with me? All right. You'll also notice there's another prophet in our list that's not in the Hebrew Bible, the prophets. Can we pick up on that? Daniel. Daniel is also considered to be in the writings in the Hebrew Bible. Now, we don't have time to discuss that today. Just know that that's one of the differences. Okay? So the first thing I want you to recognize is even the written prophets, as we consider them, is kind of a narrowized definition of that term prophet compared to the way that most people, most people of God through the generations have considered the term prophet. Are you with me? We don't consider, I mean, we, maybe we do if we stop to think about it, but we don't usually categorize, you know, um, Elijah, Elijah. You know, those were some of the, the major prophets 
in the Hebrew Bible that we just don't think of as prophets. But it even goes back further than that. You, and if you've been around for a few years, you've probably heard me say this multiple times, but the prophet in the Old Testament that was considered to be kind of the prophet beyond all prophets, or the prophet par excellence, so to speak, was who? Moses. Why? Because Moses was the intermediary. He was the one who stood between the God and Israel, or the people of God, right? And his job was then to communicate words on behalf of God. He would have these incredible transformative encounters with God, right? I think Mount Sinai. Doesn't get any more transformative than that, right? And then his job was to do what? To go and speak on behalf of God to the people. Are you with me? Okay, good. We've laid a quite a bit of groundwork so far. All right. A few other things that I just want to mention before we move to Numbers chapter 11. You can start turning there actually if you want. But the inspiration of the prophets within the people of God, it, it was a sign that the presence of God was with the people, right? It, and it was also a sign that God's Spirit was residing on the people or with the people. So, what, what I mean by that is, if there wasn't someone who was in that prophetic role of speaking on behalf of God to the people, the people assumed what? That God had stopped speaking, or that God had withdrawn his presence from them. Without the role of the intermediary, without the role of the prophet in the Old Testament, in the ancient, ancient world, they assumed that God's presence had been withdrawn from their hands. Now that's a problem, isn't it? But think about this. Like, let's try to just imagine yourself, you know, a long, 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 long time ago, okay? And you want to encounter the presence of God, but you are dependent upon a number of things. Like, one, like, you've got to travel to one particular area in the world, right? I mean, for most of the history of Israel, they thought that God only resided in the tabernacle or later the temple, right? And so you go there to be near the presence of God. But even that, you just you didn't have like this, you know, unencumbered or unhindered access to God. There were all of these barriers between you and the divine. And you were often dependent upon someone speaking God's word to you and conveying God's presence to you as well. Okay? All right. And then finally, the last thing I just want to point out that in general, in the Old Testament and, and, and around it, um, the idea of a prophet was one who's, who had received the Spirit of God that would empower them or equip them in order to fulfill some particular task or job that God had for them. Does that make sense? They, they viewed the Spirit of God as not a permanent residing presence within them. But sometimes that Spirit would call on them and then equip them to do a thing on God's behalf. Okay? So... Here's a story you may be familiar with, may not be. It's a story about the plane, okay? It's Numbers chapter 11. And if you go there, um, at the beginning of this chapter, the people of Israel are on their way to the Promised Land. They have been released from, e from Egypt in captivity by God. And, you know, what did they do on that journey? They start complaining, right? Like, You're taking a long road trip with children? It's like that. They get sick of man, you know, this miraculous provision of food that God had given them, which in the beginning must have been incredible, right? But after so long, you know, people get tired of doing the same thing, and people of Israel start complaining. Moses is angry, God's angry, everybody's angry, okay? Moses starts complaining to God in the midst of this chapter. You know, God, the burden that you have given me to lead these people is too much to bear. And so Moses asked that God would help distribute the load, and, and God you know, accepts this request from Moses. And so, this story, we're going to pick up in verse 24 of, of Numbers 11. But God has said to Moses to gather the 70 elders of Israel, and that um, the spirit that God has put on Moses would be divided among these 70 elders, these 70 leaders of, of Israel. So, Numbers chapter 11, verse 24. We'll pick up the story there. So Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said brought together 70 of their elders and had them stand around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him. And he took some of the power of the Spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And the Spirit rested on them and prophesied, but did not do so again. Okay. 
come out here just for a second. For one thing, like I told you before, they didn't view um, God's spirit as you know residing in someone on a permanent basis. It was kind of a temporal basis or a temporary basis in the Old Testament, where God would God's spirit would pour out on them. They would then either speak on behalf of God or act on behalf of God um, to do something that God had required or was asking them to do. Okay. And so in this particular story, um, the spirit that was on Moses was divided up among these elders of Israel, but they were only given it for this brief amount of time. They, they did not do so again in the text on this. Verse 26. This is where it gets a little strange. However, two men whose names were Eldad and Medad had, re had remained in the camp. They were listed among the elders, but they did not go out to that the Spirit also rested on them, and they prophesied in the camp. Now, again, we'll pause here for just a second. This is a problem, right? These guys didn't follow directions. They didn't follow protocol. They are unauthorized prophets, right? But the Spirit of God rested on them, too, and they began prophesying. Now, this seems like a problem, right? And so there's this young man, uh, I think met that verse 27, says that a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And then verse 28, Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' aide since he spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop that. But Moses replied, and this is the key verse, right, in verse 29. But Moses replied, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put the Spirit on them. Isn't that Moses is sick of the load that he's carrying, right? Praise to God and ask God to distribute this load, to share the load. And, and God does. God answers his prayer. He distributes it to these other leaders, these elders of Israel. But even beyond that, Moses still wishes and, and longs for the day when not just the select, not just the few would have access to God and speak on behalf of God, but that everybody would. Now, that's a pretty radical notion, isn't it? I mean, especially in the ancient world, because, I mean, it wasn't just the Israelites, but culture after culture, you know, assumed that in order to encounter some type of divine presence, like you had to go through either an intermediary or a temple or some other authorized channel. And Moses, he wants to throw all that out of the window, doesn't he? He's looking forward, he's longing for the day when everyone would be a prophet, and God's spirit would reside in everyone. When was that day for me? Kind of close, right? Acts chapter 2. I mean, Acts chapter 2 is the fulfillment of Moses' dream, of Moses' prayer, of Moses' longing. But before that, we're going to kind of stop in the middle a little bit, you might say, with the prophet Joel. Okay? Now, Joel is one of those prophets in the book of 12. The second, Hosea Joel. Okay? Uh, let me just say this. In the brief version of the Old Testament, there is a different order of the twelve than we find in the Hebrew Bible. Our order of the twelve matches the Hebrew Bible order of the twelve, okay? But in all three, the prophet Joel is always second. So there you go. Okay. Joel, second book of the twelve. Um, it's a book that we don't return to very often, honestly. Um, usually when we're talking about Joel, it's on the because of Peter's quotation in Joel chapter 2 that shows up in Acts chapter 2. Have read it? But within the book of Joel, um, it begins, I mean, things are, are pretty bleak. Judgment of God has come. There is this locust plague that has just ravaged the land and ravaged the people, and that has just sort of spiraled out of control. There's this massive drought, and um, one of the similarities between Numbers chapter 11 and, and Joel chapter 2 is that both of them come in the midst of a food crisis. Now, you might say that complaining about manna and this sort of drought and locust plague are not similar. That is very true. But it's still in the midst of the food crisis in both of them. And, and then Joel is beginning then to talk not just about, you know, what is currently happening, but someday that this judgment of God is going to prevent, the people are going to experience the healing and the mercy of God. And then Joel picks up on this idea that Moses spoke about so long ago in Numbers 11. Um, there in Joel chapter 2. So I know I read a very similar passage from Peter's quotation earlier, but I'm going to read it again. This is Joel 2, 28. 
And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and those of smoke. The sun will return to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, even among survivors whom the Lord calls. In the midst of this devastating plague, devastating drought, people begin to lament. Joel begins to speak a word of hope into their despair, and that, that word of hope then begins to take a new and radical vision of someday God's Spirit isn't just going to be poured out upon the people, it's going to be poured out on everyone. Now, one of the kind of interesting things about this passage in Joel chapter 2 is it doesn't seem like the purpose of this pouring out of God's Spirit is solely to lead the people of God to do God's work. No, I'm not sure that's part of it, right? God's pouring out the Spirit in order to equip them to do the work that God has for them. But God is also just pouring out His Spirit upon all people so that everybody can experience the divine presence. God's presence. It's this relational component that Joel is, you might say, dreaming about or envisioning. You know, he is longing for the day when someday it's not going to be like this. And it's not just that you know, we're going to have water, we're going to have crops again, but someday God is going to reside with us in a new and radical way. Now, he's certainly not the only prophet that talks about this. I mean, uh, prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 31, famously talks about, you know, someday you're not going to have the law written on tablets of stone, but written on what? On the human heart. You know, God is going to be so near to us that he's even going to be within us so that we might live in accordance and in relationship with God. Also, the prophet Ezekiel speaks about this in a few different, I mean, well, several different places, but I'm going to pick up on two of them real quick. Ezekiel 36, um, talking about God bringing the people back out of exile, and Ezekiel 36, 26, it says, God says, I will give you a new heart, put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit in you move to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. A few chapters later in Ezekiel 39, God says, I will no longer hide my face from them, for I will pour out my spirit on the people of Israel, declares the sovereign Lord. It was about more than just having a task, more than just having a mission or a purpose. It was also about having a relationship and experiencing the very presence of God. Spirit of God led to both new life and transformation for the people of God. And so then, in Acts chapter 2, um, if you turn there, this will be the last place we turn today. So Acts chapter 2. Um, I'm going to pick up at the beginning of Acts chapter 2, which is before the part we read earlier. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, the sound of the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in the wilderness because each one of them heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? And then they began listening to all these different groups of people. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. In verse 12, amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, What does this mean? What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they've had too much fun. And that's when Peter gets up begins to speak. And he quotes the prophet Joel in Joel chapter 2. One of the interesting things that I think we find again and again in Scripture is that Scripture is often in a conversation with itself, right? That 
the longing of Moses in Numbers chapter 11 was picked back up by the prophet Joel as he spoke of someday that longing of Moses is going to be enacted and fulfilled. And then Peter picks up the words of Joel and the same ideas that were transmitted from Moses, by the way. There's a lot of imagery of the giving of the law and, and Moses encountering the presence of God that shows up here in Acts chapter 2 as well. We're going to get into that this morning. But in the midst of all of this, Peter's saying, in order to understand what's happening in our day, we have to understand what Scripture has been talking about in earlier days, right? And it's being fulfilled here in our midst. And Peter picks up that Joel chapter 2 quotation, and he's trying to explain to them, you know, the bizarre events that are happening all around them. But more importantly, what he's trying to get to is the end of that passage that he quotes. It's not just that God's Spirit is going to be poured out on all people, though it is. And though it's incredible, it's not just the men, and it's not just the elders, and it's not just anybody else that was sort of viewed to be at the top of the ladder. It's poured out on everybody, old and young, men and women, servants and masters, and everybody in between, which basically means what? All of us. That day, that generation after generation after generation of faithful, God-following people have been longing for is the day that you and I get to live how often do we take that for granted? Do you ever think about that? You don't have to travel across the world to fulfill the will of God in your life, or to experience the presence of God, or to understand, or to get a taste of the power of God, or to find purpose with God. You get to experience it in the here and now, and you don't need me, or your deacon, or any other one, your pope, or any other religious figure be able to do so because you have access to the unmitigated and direct presence of God because of what Jesus has done. That's good news. And man, we can look back to the people of Israel and think how spoiled and selfish were they complaining in the desert when God was providing miraculous bread for them. But we are spoiled rotten by our day and our time. And we don't recognize how good You, too, can experience the presence of God. There's, there's nothing hindering you from doing so. And of all the miracles of Pentecost, this seems to me to be near the top, isn't it? We, too, can experience the presence of God. And, and, and the part of the quote that Peter is, is leading to, he begins quoting Joel, that he's starting this long sermon, right, where he's um, beginning to retell the story of Jesus, and, and the whole point that he's leading to, that the prophet Joel alludes to, is there at the very end. So I'm picking up in Acts chapter 2, verse 21, which again is a quotation of Joel. But Peter says, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And he begins then talking about calling upon the name of the Lord, that is Jesus. If you want to know the presence of God, and if you want to experience power of God to be able to complete the work of God. And if you want to be able to begin to understand the purpose of God in your life, all you've got to do is call on Jesus. Call on His name. And by the way, at the beginning of Peter chapter 3, he's talking about calling on the name of Jesus. And if you keep reading all the way uh, to verse 39, it talks about on all of those on whom the Lord will call. And the Lord is calling that all of us may call on the name of Jesus as well. And so who, then, brothers and sisters, are the prophets in our name? Let me suggest to you that you do not need to look far. The next time you walk in front of the mirror, the next time that you pull out your phone, turn on your camera, and flip it around to selfie mode, it's right there, right there in front of you. It's you. It's you. There is no one, no thing, no place, no nothing that is between you and God, other than just calling out. Gift. Yeah, it would be a gift to have been there that day on Pentecost in 
Spirit came down and to see that miracle of everybody talking different languages but somehow understanding what one another are saying. But it's also a gift, brothers and sisters, to be living in the age of the Spirit of God. For that same Spirit, the presence, the power, and the purpose of God is found in each and every one of you. Thanks be to God. Amen. going to sing one more song together, and uh, appropriately, uh, it's praising the name together. If you have never called on the name of Jesus, your Lord, your Savior, to be your God, um, and you would like to begin that relationship, begin to understand um, what it means to live in and with the presence of God in your life, I would love to talk to you about that. Maybe you're someone that you have a relationship with Jesus and you know him, but you haven't let him transform you in the ways that God's spirit wants to transform you. And, and maybe you need to pray with someone or talk to someone about um, allowing the words of God to continue in your life. Maybe you're looking for a group of people uh, to walk that way with you, and we would love to talk to you about what that means, uh, to be a part of this community of faith, which is only a small part of God's wider work. We are grateful to be a part of it. We invite you to be a part of it as well. Would you join us in standing to sing today?
to take a break in the summer after this Wednesday. So if you want to come and join us on Wednesday, we'd love to have you. Uh, but don't come away from Wednesday because you will not find dinner. And you will come, okay? Um, and uh, I think that is it uh, as far as announcements. Um, I hope that today you have been reminded of the great opportunity and the great privilege that we have to be the people of God. To experience the presence of God, not just on Sunday morning, not just in the sanctuary, or not even just during corporate worship, but any time and every time you are able to commune with God, to experience God's presence, to know God's purpose and God's power for your life as well. So go now and live into that calling as God's holy name. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his smile upon you and give you peace now and all of your days. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit.